Hello everyone uh, and welcome to the RSEC webinar series. Uh, this is our uh, second session uh, of this webinar series. We have done the first session in the morning uh, and this is uh, uh, basically a repeat telecast of what we have done in the morning to accommodate uh, folks who are in different time zones. So thank you for attending uh, the second uh, live session. Uh, my name is uh, Pawan Gupta. I'm a research scientist at uh, USRA and working at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Washington, D.C., USA. Uh, we have uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Melanie Cook. Uh, she is also with us, and she will provide lectures during the week two and three. We also have Mr. Brock Balvin. Uh, RC training coordinator and Miss uh, Elizabeth Hook. Uh, she's a technical writer and editor. Uh, they are helping during this webinar series uh, in their respective capacity. This webinar series uh, focus on satellite derived annual PM 2.5 mass concentration data sets in support of uh, United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals, commonly known as. Uh, SDGs. This is a three week long webinar series with one hour session each week, uh, two times in a day, focusing on various aspects of PM2.5 data sets uh, derived from the satellite, and a case study analysis will conclude the webinar series during the week three. The main objective of this webinar series are getting familiarized with SDGs and air pollution relevant goals and indicators under SDGs, understanding how satellites make measurement of particle pollution and what it takes to create global PM2.5 data sets, and finally utilizing uh, World Health Organization approved PM2.5 data sets for the year 2014 to assess the PM2.5 level at country and city level. Uh, here is a list of topics I will cover today. We will briefly introduce the RSET program and we will talk about SDGs and then we will go over some of the fundamental of satellite remote sensing. Here you will find my contact information uh, in case you need to have further questions. Uh, please feel free to email me on the given email address. With that, uh, let's start with our set or Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, uh, which is about eight year old program under NASA's Applied Sciences Capacity Building Program. Our set's mission is to empower the global community through remote sensing training with a specific goal to con to increase the use of earth observation and decision making activities for policy makers, environmental agencies and managers all and all other professionals uh, both in public and private sectors who can utilize earth observation for better decision making. Our sites offer training in following specific application areas, disaster, uh, ecological forecasting, which include land management, uh, land classification, health and air quality, through which we are doing the current webinar series, and then the water resources, which includes both water quality and water source management. Our training program are designed to address all level of expertise, uh, including for professionals. Uh, with no prior knowledge of remote sensing technique to more advanced users. Each training is classified in different level depending on the difficulty level and content. The following webinar today is considered as an advanced training uh, and which requires some knowledge of fundamental of satellite remote sensing. Our set provides both online such as this one as well as more in-depth in-person trainings which usually happens uh, in computer rooms. Uh, you can find more details information on our website about the different trainings. 
RSET air quality theme covers a range of topics starting from the fundamental of satellite remote sensing, image interpretation, satellite algorithms, data and tools with various kind of specific scientific analysis. Not all the topics covered in each training, but each training is designed to address specific applications or end user community needs. For example, this webinar series is addressing uh, particulate matter pollution in reference to United Nations Agenda 2030, uh, also known as SDGs. Uh, here is a link for our RSET website through which you register for this course. RSET website serve as main interface between RSET team and professional who are taking our trainings. All the information about the incoming training, past training materials, recordings of online trainings, RSET training applications, certificate policies, contact details of individuals, and everything is shared through this website. Uh, all of the material and everything on this website is available for anyone to use free of charge. I would strongly recommend for everyone to browse the website and if you like to receive regular update about our training activities, please join our listserv by clicking on the link provided on the uh, this slide. Uh, we usually send out one email once in a month and that contains a lot of information about our upcoming trainings and other uh, updates from our team. Okay, so let's begin to understand what are these United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are. SDGs are United Nations recently released goal for sustainable development by 2030. As the document describes, this is a plan of action for people, planet, and prosperity. All countries are partner in this implementing Agenda 2030. Under this plan, there are 17 SDGs identified with 169 specific targets covering social, economical and environmental development goals. In this webinar series, our focus will be environmental goals with a specific target on particulate matter air pollution. For further details, please visit this SDG website, uh, which is hosted under United Nations to get more details on the topic. So let's understand why particulate matter air pollution or PM2.5 matters and how it is relevant to the sustainable development. This map, what you see on your screen, is an outcome of a recent study on a global burden of disease by global community of scientists quantifying the impact of air pollution where they estimate the number of possible deaths due to various risk factors including air pollution. The new estimates tell us that there are about 5.5 million deaths occur in year 2013 attributed to air pollution which include both household air pollution and ambient air pollution or outdoor air pollution. This study has utilized satellite and model-based estimates of pollution to quantify the impact on human health. And according to this report, air pollution now ranked the number fourth risk factor for death globally. Also here you can see the number distributions uh, among various countries and majority of the shares in 5.5 million deaths are contributed by countries like India and China where air pollution has been a severe problem for a number of years. Therefore, the Agenda 2030 identify air pollution is one of the indicator for sustainable development around the world and all the countries are partnering in achieving that goal. Under the SDGs, there are two separate goals where PM2.5 or ambient air pollution monitoring is mandated for all the countries. 
the PM 2.5 are particulate matter with aerodynamic diameter less than 2.5 micron in size identify as an indicator. Uh, the first goal is goal number 11 under which the target 11.6 specifically says that annual mean level of fine particulate matter needs to be monitored uh, both for uh, at city level and at country level. The goal number three is more relevant uh, related to the health uh, health of uh, human beings and it ensures healthy lives and promotes well-being for all at all ages. Uh, so in order to achieve the goal number three there is an indicator 3.9.1 which basically says mortality rate attributed to household ambient air pollution and this we can only calculate if we have uh, good ground monitors data or the uh, uh, long-term data or the monitoring data of ambient air pollution either from surface satellite or uh, combination of the two. So let's before uh, we move forward I would like to uh, do a pause very quickly and would like to actually pause a couple of questions uh, just to gauge uh, what kind of uh, uh, expectation we are looking from the audience. So what you will see on your screen is a quick poll and you have about 30 seconds to respond to this and it is related to the SDGs. So if you or your organization directly or indirectly uh, involved actually in the SDGs activities then please respond to this question. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to close the poll in next three seconds. Uh, okay, so if you have answered yes, there is another question uh, which will uh, tell us a little bit more about your involvement on air pollution related parameter in support of SDG. So if you are involved in reporting this parameter, uh, please respond to this poll as well. Again, you have 30 seconds to respond. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for responding to those two questions. Now I will move to the next section of this presentation uh, where we will discuss about the air quality monitoring. So we will discuss the briefly about the measurements and where the satellite fits into the picture before going to that there are several common terminology used by the different communities and their meaning could be same or different based on the reference. Here in this webinar series we'll use the following terms uh, aerosols, particulate matter, atmospheric aerosols or particles with more or less same meaning. So just want to make sure that when I say one or another term uh, basically I'm talking about the same thing. What here you see is the a graphical view of uh, different sources of uh, atmospheric aerosols or particles uh, on the bottom side of the image sitting on the either on the ground and then you see several uh, atmospheric uh, phenomena which can have impact which are directly or indirectly related to the aerosols. So aerosols are tiny in size it varies from nanometer to millimeter size ranges. Uh, the image from the surface or sometimes they also form in the atmosphere by chemical reaction. Climate community study them for their impacts on clouds and earth radiation budget and so on. Air quality community study them for emission monitoring and their impact on human health. Uh, and there are other impacts such as visibility, which is monitored by the transportation and aviation community and industry. 
since there are many different sources of aerosols on the Earth's surface, therefore they are highly variable in space time and size, shape and chemical composition. Here some of the prominent sources are listed such as dust from arid regions, emissions from fossil fuels and biomass burning and occasionally volcanoes put out lot of aerosols in the atmosphere. And there are many other sources which are not listed here such as sea salt from ocean, biogenic aerosols and so on. Traditionally, what you here see is the uh, images of the instruments which are used to make uh, air quality measurement from the surface. On the left, uh, you see more uh, sophisticated instruments and on the right, you will see more commercially available low cost sensors. Traditionally, uh, PM2.5 air quality monitoring is measured using various instruments at the ground. These instruments include uh, samplers which collects particles from air on the filter and then the mass concentration or the chemical compositions are derived in the laboratory. There are other types mostly based on the optical method which can provide more continuous measurement uh, every hour or every minute such as the BAM V-titonation measurement which is must one of the reference method. More recently, there is a flood of low cost air quality sensor which you can see on the right side. Commercially available for continuous air quality monitoring both for indoor and outdoor purposes. Some of these are capable in providing information on your cell phone as well. Usually low cost sensors are more used for awareness purposes and less for scientific and regulatory purposes due to potentially larger uncertainties in these measurements. So what these instruments provide or what the monitoring means. You may have seen these kind of color coded air quality index saying good, moderate, poor or unhealthy uh, on various me media platforms. Sometimes air quality reports are also part of the weather forecast. So the air quality index and associated health advisory is one way to communicate to the public. These are done using continuous monitoring from surface and forecasting is done using models. In the US, you can see the density of ground monitors with some special gaps on the bottom right panel where the different color shows the air quality or the air quality index categories. Green means the good, yellow means the moderate and then as you move towards the orange and red colors, uh, basically air quality becomes unhealthy for sensitive group or for everyone else. So these are the basic information which are usually tra uh, transmitted or communicated to the public uh, to make sure they are aware of air quality in their region. So now let's look at the globally how the PM2.5 monitoring is done and where are the gaps. Ground sensors give us by far the most accurate measurement of ground level pollutants. The ground sensors network which is not complete list of all ground stations are indicated by the colored dots on the upper image. The image on the lower right shows population density. You can see that several areas of the globe with significant population density have almost no monitor at all. For example, over Africa, part of Eurasia, part of good part of Asia, Australia, South America, there are many, many regions around the world with high population density and with no ground monitors. One important thing to note is that even in the US, which we have seen a uh, dense network of ground monitors, about 30% of the total population have no PM monitoring. So that's very uh, uh, good part of the population is unmonitored. This is just to summarize the same thing which I have been telling that many countries do not have PM2.5 measurement. The special registration from the existing network does not support the high population density and sometimes the surface measurements are not cost effective uh, if we are planning to do monitoring at global scale. So let's see how we can use the satellite observation or what does satellite provides. 
there are many satellites capable of uh, global uh, monitoring of particulate measurements on each day. Here you can see a product called aerosol optical depth or AOD, which is an optical measurement of total column aerosol in the entire column of the atmosphere. And this particular image or map shows a seasonal mean values from one of the NASA sensors called MODIS, which is on board on aqua satellite, which make measurement in afternoon time. What is attracting about these maps are there's no gap. Satellite can provide global observation even in places where surface monitoring may not be feasible due to the practical reasons. These are aerosol maps from satellite and it is amazing that we can identify major aerosol regimes of the world such as dust over Saharan desert during the spring and summer season. Uh, we can also see uh, biomass burning in South African regions and over Amazon region in the late fall. Uh, you can see uh, haze and pollution over eastern United States and parts of India and China. And there are other major sources which can be easily identify which varies from season to season. The special coverage from the satellite is key advantage over the ground monitors. In the later part of the next week, we will learn about limitations and uncertainties which involved in satellite based air pollution monitoring. The maps on the previous slide is just from one satellite sensor, but there are multiple satellites in orbit just from the NASA which have capabilities to provide some pieces of information related to air pollution. These are marked by red arrows in this uh, particular graphics uh, following the constellation of Earth observing satellite. This is just uh, showing the number of satellite from the NASA, but other ag space agencies around the world, uh, including from India, China, Korea, Japan, uh, Europe, Russia, they have their own remote sensing sensor, which does provide important information on atmospheric uh, uh, air quality or the uh, particles in the atmospheres. So, now I'm going to do another pause and we'll bring back to a uh, couple of the questions just to uh, gauge uh, where we stand in terms of what we have learned so far. So with that, I will provide you another poll question and this should be very easier for you to answer. So uh, you have about 30 seconds to answer this poll uh, and it is related to how we are making the traditional air quality measurement using what kind of instruments. Air quality. Okay, so the next question is, uh, I'm going to put here another poll, uh, which is uh, the main advantage of using satellite observation to monitor air quality is, which one? Again, you have about 30 seconds to respond to this question. And we just learn about this specific uh, aspect of satellite remote sensing few slides back. Great, thank you. So the main, uh, actually 100 people got it right. Uh, the main advantage of using satellite over ground measurements is uh, better spatial coverage. With that, uh, I will go back to the presentation and we'll start the next section of the presentation which is related to the fundamental of satellite remote sensing. Now we will learn how satellite make measurement and what we can learn from it in terms of the air pollution. 
So as the name suggests, uh, remote sensing is the science of obtaining information about objects or area from a distance. Our eyes are natural remote sensing sensor which can obtain visual information about an object from distance without being in direct physical contact of it. Uh, simple photographic camera or another most frequently used uh, remote sensing sensor which can capture images and record them. Remote sensing instrument can be placed on many different platforms. Here you can see some examples. Uh, your application will help you decide which platform is most useful to you. There are several questions that needs to be answered to determine which platform is most useful such as how much detail do you need and how frequently do you need this information. I will be more focusing on the satellite remote sensing. Uh, so we are going to put our instrument on the satellite and discussing how this work in this webinar is related to the, uh, the data which we get from these sensors which are on board on satellites. The next thing to understand is how satellite and sensors collect this information. Optical or passive remote sensing satellite depends on the sun as the sole source of radiation which you can see on the picture on the left side. Solar radiation passes through the atmosphere, hits the target at the surface such as the forest, water, gas, soil or any human made made up area or either transmitted or absorbed or reflected. Satellite orbiting in the space which you can see on the right side of this image receive this reflectance radi reflected radiance with very sophisticated instruments. The radiation captured by the satellite contain information about objects through which radiation got reflected either from atmosphere or from the surface. So here the bottom left image is similar to what we have seen in the previous slide. Basically we have sun radiation coming down to earth and interacting with various components of earth atmosphere system. Now this re sun's radiation is electromagnetic radiation with varying wavelength uh, and you can see that uh, it varies all the way from the gamma ray to the TV and radio which are very long in terms of the wavelength. Sensors which makes measurements on atmosphere particle typically works in the UV and visible part of the solar spectrum which you can see here in the color highlighted as 0.4 to 0.7 micrometer wavelength which is a visible and then before 0.4 the ultraviolet regions start. So some of the measurements are used by ultraviolet wavelength but most of the particle measurements are used uh, for use the solar spectrum uh, between 0.4 and 0.7 micrometer. So in general satellite images we uh, so let's assume that our uh, imaginary satellite imaginary satellite have three channels namely blue green, red as they can make measurement in those wavelengths. So in general satellite images we often see are the combination of these three channels or these three wavelengths as they are called the true color images or RGBs. Uh, they are called true color because they appear very close to what our human eye can see from this space. And you can see that an example here on the bottom right image where we have measurements or the three images taken in the three different channel on the red, green and blue and if you combine them the together then you will see a color uh, RGB or the true color image which will show features of earth and atmosphere system in very similar way as our human eye can see. Here is an example of an image, true color image taken by one of the NASA's uh, sensor called MODIS. It is a true color image which is a combination of again red, green and blue channels. Here we can identify various atmospheric and land features. Uh, we can see clouds at white, bright, land is a brown here. Uh, we can also see 
some snow which is as bright as cloud in this case. Uh, we also see some aerosols over land over uh, eastern part of uh, India and over uh, uh, northern part of the Pakistan here. Uh, we can also see some uh, aerosols or haze over Arabian Sea and over the Bas Bank or the Bay of Bengal area. Uh, another feature you can see here is a sun glint uh, which is a very bright uh, region over ocean. Sun glint often only occur over oceans and those are masked when we do the aerosol uh, and getting an aerosol information and we can talk about that more if you have interest in later part. Uh, the black area is called data collection gap and this is due to the uh, also called the orbital gaps. So depending on which sensor we are looking, uh, these gaps can be small or large or there can be no gaps at all. So here are some example of uh, images of these tiny particles which we can look through in the satellite images. Uh, the volcanic plumes are very uh, uh, vary in appearance depending on the type of eruption. Uh, here you see the color uh, of Indonesian eruption as a whitish and which suggests that it might be have more ash dominated and uh, sulfate type of aerosol dominated which scattered most of the solar radiation in the visible part of the spectrum and that makes that color very uh, uh, like cloud or um, hazy. The thick black smoke uh, below from the fires burning uh, at the oil depot in western India. Uh, this picture is taken on October 2000, October 30, 2009 uh, with, uh, which shows oil fires uh, from a oil depot in near the city of Jaipur and you can see very thick plume of smoke. So the oil, uh, when you burn the oil, the smoke looks actually very black because of the high absorbing particles emitted from those kind of fires. You can also see dust on the top left side uh, which is an Australian dust which looks brownish in color. Uh, usually dust particles are large in size. You can also see some urban and uh, or industrial uh, particles mixed with the smoke pollution over eastern uh, India and Bangladesh uh, which uh, looks more like hazy and that's uh, very prominent features uh, in that part of the region world. Here are some more examples. Uh, again the dust, Saharan dust over Africa both over land and oceans looks very different in color than the smoke uh, over ocean on the right side from the fires in California. Uh, you can see other pictures of smoke from Alaskan fires uh, in 2004 and then again the pollution, industrial pollution and smoke pollution over eastern, east United States, uh, east coast of United States. So in general, uh, uh, satellite images, these true color images provide you a visual information about different types of aerosols which we can see based on their uh, concentration in the atmospheres. And we get this visual information from the satellite. As we discussed earlier, there are a number of satellites making observations around the globe on daily basis. Here are some daily coverage examples. All these three sensors provide daily information on atmospheric particles or aerosols. The black area are called or orbital gaps means there is no data. Uh, the MODIS sensor as we have been discussing very frequently throughout this presentation and the next presentation, next few presentation have some gaps in the orbit. Uh, in the tropical regions. Uh, MISER is another instrument which is on board on the same satellite and Mo, as MODIS which has much larger orbital gaps and it only covers the entire globe in eight to nine days uh, because of its design and specific application. And the more recently launched instrument called VIRS on NPP satellite uh, does not have any orbital gap. In fact, it has some overlaps in tropics. Uh, due to its design. So depending on which satellite we are looking, uh, the coverage can be different uh, in different part of the world.
Once satellites send these spectral radiance to surface, uh, as we have seen in the RGB image or the radiance in the red, blue, green channel or more channels, scientists develop retrieval algorithms to extract the desired information about the Earth atmosphere. Inside the retrieval algorithm, the spectral radiance are combined with theoretical radiate transfer calculation along with a prior information and make a lot of assumptions to convert the satellite measurements into geophysical quantity such as temperature, wind speed, or in our specific case aerosol optical depth or PM2.5 mass concentration. So one thing to remember is that satellite does not make direct measurement of these quantities but what satellite make measurement are the spectral radiance which we at the surface once the satellite transmit those data to the ground scientists develop this computer algorithms which are much more sophisticated algorithm take into account various other aspect and a prior information and convert them into geophysical parameters so the satellite measurements of air pollutions are not direct measurement as we do from the ground based instrument. So with that, uh, before moving to the next topic, uh, I would like to again do a pause and put out a poll question. So let's see. Uh, the next question is, a remote sensing sensor always needs to be installed on a satellite. Is it true and false? So you have again 30 seconds to respond to it and then we will move forward. Okay, great. So the correct answer of this question is uh, uh, like you can see the results, 87% uh, people have responded false and that's the correct answer. Uh, as we have seen that depending on the application and the purpose, uh, a remote sensing sensor can be installed on any platform uh, all the way from the vehicles, on your, your tripod or balloon or air, aircraft or satellite. Uh, so it's not necessary. So the next question is another one which is related to the trucular images and I'm launching it now. It's again uh, trucular images which we have just seen are combination of following three colors. Uh, Okay, great. Uh, so as you can see from the uh, response, 94% says it's a red, green, and blue, and that is correct answer. Uh, true color images are also called RGBs, which stand for red, green, and blue. That's another way to remember the color combination. Okay, I have one more question before we move to the next section, and this is related to the uh, it's a very important concept of satellite remote sensing which we just talked about is satellite directly measure what quantity. Okay, great. Thank you. So as you can see from the response, 98% people say the spectral radiance and that is the correct answer. Uh, again, I would re want to re-emphasize that satellite does not make direct measurement of aerosols or PM2.5. What, what do, do they measure is re spectral radiance which we used uh, in computer algorithms to convert that into a geophysical quantity such as the aerosols optical tap. With that, uh, I will move forward with the next section uh, which we, where we will talk a little bit more about this quantity called aerosol optical depth and how we can use it for to infer PM2.5. Uh, aerosol optical depth uh, 
or in general it is called AOD. Uh, it is also called aerosol optical thick thickness or AOD. Uh, both have same meaning here. Aerosol optical depth is related to PM2.5. Both terms can represent the presence of aerosols and its impact on the visibility and haziness of the atmosphere. Uh, what you see here is a technical definition which says op the optical depth expresses the quantity of light removed from a beam by scattering or absorption during its path through a medium. Remember, we have seen in our previous slide that as solar radiation passes through the atmosphere, it interacts with various components in the atmosphere like aerosol particles, cloud and everything. So depending on those uh, properties of those components, uh, the radiation can be scattered or absorbed uh, and it can attenuate and that is what this optical depth is. Uh, so mathematically, it can be represented by this following equation uh, which involves top of the atmosphere radiance and what we can make measurement. Optical depth due to aerosols uh, in this uh, equation, uh, aerosols in the entire column of the atmosphere is called aerosol optical depth and which can be me uh, measured using the instrument called sun photometer which is located on the ground. On the left you will see a more sophisticated instrument uh, which can make measurement uh, in 10 different spectral channels and it takes every 10-15 minutes. It basically tracks the sun all day long uh, since morning to evening and make measurement under cloud free condition. On the right what you see here is a more compact version of that sun photometer uh, which is commercially available called Microtops. Uh, it's a handheld sun photometer and you can point that instrument towards the sun to make measurement of aerosol optical depth. Sometimes these instruments can be also used to get uh, other quantities such as the water vapor amount in the atmosphere, uh, ozone optical depth and other parameters as well. So PM2.5 and aerosol optical depth both are actually related uh, to the presence of aerosols and its impact on visibility or haziness in the atmosphere. So therefore the satellite derived aerosol optical depth which we can use uh, to surrogate actually represent uh, the particulate matter at the surface. On the left there is a very high level of particulate matter uh, of 45 microgram per cubic meter image. And on the right, what you see is the image taken on the same day at the same location at the same time of the day, but two different days. So on the left, the PM2.5 measurement shows 45 microgram per cubic meter. On the right, it shows 4 microgram per cubic meter. If I had to make measurement of aerosol optical depth on these two locations, I would get aerosol optical depth about 0.8 under the uh, left image condition and under the right image condition the AOD values will be about 0.1. So basically these two uh, images clearly shows that uh, either I can use PM2.5 or aerosol optical depth to quantify the haziness in the uh, sky or in the atmosphere. Here is another example from the Singapore. Uh, the top image shows conditions with high aerosol optical depth, uh, no clear visibility. On the bottom, uh, things are very visible, uh, visibility is very high and this is usually considered as the low aerosol loading conditions or if you make measurement of optical depth, you will see low AOD values. So let's learn a little bit more about aerosol optical depth and from satellite, how does it look? It represents the entire column of the atmosphere as we have seen from the surface to the satellite which you can see on the right side of this column. So this entire uh, grayish color column represents the uh, area for which this aerosol optical depth represents, surface to the satellite height. It also has a horizontal resolution. Uh, in case of MODIS sensor, the product is about 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer. Uh, whereas the surface measurement which we make uh, uh, for air quality, they are usually located near the surface and considered as the point measurement. The AOD depends on particle size, uh, their chemical composition, their shape, amount of water 
or in other word hygroscopic nature of the particle and of course the vertical distribution in the atmosphere. Also uh, like we talked earlier that the retrieval, retrieving geophysical parameters such as the aerosol optical depth involve making assumptions uh, therefore those parameters also affects the value of aerosol optical depth. Aerosol optical depth either from satellite or surface are measured and reported at particular wavelength. Uh, most AOD values are reported on multiple wavelengths depending on available ch uh, channels on satellites. Making measurement of AODs at different wavelengths have advantages and can provide additional piece of information about these particles. The most common wavelength at which AOD is reported and used for various air quality and climate application is 550 nanometer or 0.55 micrometer. The current map shows a global view of multi-year mean aerosol optical depth from a sensor called MODIS which is on board on aqua satellite which make measurement during the afternoon hours. The region with regions with red colors are identified as high aerosol loading, those more polluted region. Regions with dark blue colors are lower polluted areas. This global view of aerosol particles is only possible from the satellite measurement which provide almost daily global measurement. Current satellite algorithm do not provide these measurement in cloudy conditions over snow and ice during and during the night time. Again few things to uh, remember uh, to read uh, about the aerosol optical depth is uh, aerosol optical depth is a column indicated value. It's an optical measurement of aerosol loading in the atmosphere. This is a unitless quantity. It does not have any unit uh, which is uh, not the case for PM2.5 which is make done in microgram per cubic meter whereas the AOD is unitless. Uh, Aerosol optical depth is function of shape, size, type of type and number concentration of aerosols in the atmosphere and wavelength at which the measurements are taken. As we discussed earlier that satellite does not make direct measurement of AOD but they are retrieved using inversion algorithm. Therefore there are uncertainties in AOD values which varies over different region of the world. Validation of satellite derived parameter against ground measurement is one of the most important part. And what you see here is a network of those uh, ground bit sophisticated sun photometer which we have seen earlier in AOD definition slide is called Aeronet. It's a NASA run uh, aerosol robotic network around the globe. There are about 400 active uh, aeronet sites around the world making measurement every 15 minutes during the daytime. These measurements of aerosol optical depth are considered ground truth and are used to validate the satellite aerosol algorithm. They are also used to get more information about uh, other uh, pieces of information about atmospheric aerosols such as uh, their shape, size, uh, size distribution, uh, and their scattering or absorption properties such as single scattering albedo uh, and reflective indices. Uh, these measurements also actually helps a lot uh, to improve the algorithms in places where the algorithm performance is not uh, up to the mark. Okay, so now the last section uh, I will focus more on how we can convert this quantity which is aerosol optical depth from the satellite to this PM2.5 and the rest of the webinar series will focus on that and then we'll use the data to do some more uh, air quality assessment. Again this is a very similar slide which I have shown earlier. What you see here are a PM2.5 measurement which is sitting at the surface of the earth. It's a dry mass concentration of particles less than 2.5 micron in aerodynamic diameter and it represents the aerosol concentration in the surface layer. Whereas the satellite is making measurement for the entire column up of the atmosphere. So it is not only represent the entire column surface to the top of the atmosphere, 
but also it has a horizontal resolution. Uh, in case of MODIS, it's about 10 by 10 kilometer, so it does have a much more larger area uh, averaged value as compared to the point measurement for the PM2.5. Uh, again, some of the differences and similarities between AOD and PM2.5 as we have been discussing. AOD is a column integrated value, PM2.5 is near the surface. Uh, AOD is a unitless quantity, PM2.5 is, uh, is represented in microgram per cubic meter. Uh, AOD is a function of safe size and type of number concentration of aerosols and it represents all kind of aerosol present in the atmosphere whereas PM2.5 only represent particles less than 2.5 micrometer in aerodynamic diameter. Uh, aerosol optical depth is represented for a specific wavelength whereas PM2.5 is just a uh, physical mass concentration. So there are uh, several differences between these two quantities but in the beginning of uh, early 2000 when uh, scientists realized that uh, if we can use this uh, aerosol optical depth quantity which we get from the satellite or the ground measurement to infer PM2.5 or PM10. So on the left what you have uh, see is the aerosol optical depth on x-axis and PM10 on the y-axis and what you see here is a linear uh, relationship between these quant uh, two quantities. And this is an example from the Italy. Uh, aerosol optical depth is measured using Aeronet and the PM10 is measured using some uh, air quality monitors in that location. Uh, the correlation is very high, 0 0.8, uh, but there is also a scritter. But it does suggest that these two quantities are related and can be used one to retrieve other. Another example on the right is a, a PM2.5 versus aerosol optical depth, in this case derived from the MODIS sensor at 550 nanometer or 0.55 micron. And again, you can see the similar relationship. The relationship is linear with scatter plot. Different color shows different stations. And the correlation in this case is about 0.7. And again, this suggests that uh, Yes, there is a relationship, but there could be also large uncertainty between these two quantities uh, in terms of their relationship. If we have to do this relationship over uh, all the stations, in this case we have done this over uh, entire United States where we have more than thousands ground monitors located. And what you see here is a color code map of linear correlation coefficient between aerosol optical depth and PM2.5. And First thing you will notice is the, linear, the relationship is not consistent over different places. It varies. Uh, in the eastern United States, you will see high degree of correlation between these two quantities, uh, whereas in the western United States, you will see the correlations are lower. And there are many, many different reasons for these differences in relationship. Uh, they, it depends on the uncertainties. Uh, involved in satellite retrieval of aerosol optical depth, which are, that could be related to the surface aerosol type. Uh, this also, uh, this relationship is also a uh, function of local meteorological conditions such as temperature, uh, wind speed, boundary layer height, uh, relative humidity, and other parameter. So there are many, many different uh, uh, parameters or environmental uh, factors which can actually change this relationship. Therefore, uh, if we have to get this relationship, then it is better to retrieve over different places and use that instead of using relationship at one place and using another place might provide large uncertainty in retrieved PM2.5 mass concentration using this method. Over the years, uh, in last 15 years, uh, people have moved on from the two variable simple regression equation to more sophisticated statistical approach. Uh, there have been hundreds or thousands of papers published all around the world showing more sophisticated methods which involve uh, including more parameters which can change this relationship. Uh, there is another approach called model scaling where you combine the satellite observation with uh, chemical transport models, global models, uh, and calculate the PM2.5 concentration. And we'll talk about this approach more in the week two presentation next week. Uh, 
the data assimilation is one of the another technique uh, which has not fully utilized yet. Only few groups around the world do that. Uh, in that uh, method, basically, you take the satellite data and assimilate into existing air quality models or uh, global climate models, and then uh, that should change. That should actually provide you better estimation of PM 2.5 at the surface. We'll uh, review more in more detail the model scaling approach in the week two. Uh, so I want to, before we end this webinar series, I want to come back to this picture which we have seen about the global monitoring of PM2.5. And what you see here in this picture is the large data gaps all around the world. So our purpose through this webinar series and using the satellite data is basically changing this pictures of global uh, view of aerosols of PM2.5 uh, from from going from this large gaps to the field area with every single point on the planet Earth, we can have a value of PM2.5 derived from the combination of satellite data and surface measurement. Uh, this is just a map of annual mean PM2.5 concentration. So this is our ultimate goals. Of course, there are limitations and uncertainty involved in this process. And we will learn about those aspects uh, as we move along this webinar series in week two and week three. Uh, and uh, before moving to the question answer, I would like to actually put out two more uh, poll questions. Uh, so the first question is, aerosol optical depth represents aerosol loading near the surface. Uh, it's a true and false, and you have 30 seconds to respond. Okay, great, thank you. So you can see that most people chose uh, the answer false, and that's the right answer. Uh, as we have seen in a number of slides, uh, aerosol optical depth represents the aerosols amount in the entire column of the atmosphere, uh, not just near the surface, unless it is specified specifically. So the correct answer is false. Uh, now the next question is similar question but uh, regarding the PM2.5. So again you have 30 seconds to respond to this question. Okay, so the correct answer of this uh, question is false. As you have seen, 60% people are uh, uh, correctly identifying that. Uh, PM2.5, which is measured to monitor the air quality from the ground instruments, it's a, a dry mass concentration of uh, particles less than 2.5 micrometer in aerodynamic diameter. Uh, it is monitored specifically to monitor the nose level air quality. Uh, whether it's a good, bad, or unhealthy for certain um, people. And that is why it represents only near the surface. It's not column integrated values such as aerosol optical depth. So uh, just want to make sure uh, you understand these difference between these two quantities uh, and the similarities as well uh, before we can utilize the satellite data to address the air pollution uh, in the atmosphere. If you are interested more about learning about this aerosol optical depth and PM2.5 relationship uh, and want to get on the specific details, there are a number of papers uh, published. Uh, I have put some reference here. Uh, one of the specific paper I will recommend is a review paper published in Air and West Management Journal. It was published in 2009, which really provide uh, very detailed analysis of what satellite can and cannot do. Um, here is the link for that paper. If you are interested in uh, reading it, please go ahead and download from this link. Before moving to the end of this webinar series, uh, I would like to point out that uh, there is a homework associated with each week. Uh, the week one homework can be accessed through this web link. It's an online form where you can fill your responses. It should not take more than 10 minutes to respond to this short homework questions. 
and all the materials uh, including the recording of this webinar series uh, and the homework link uh, and other details should be accessed through this uh, uh, webinar web page which is can be accessed through this web link on this slide. Next week we will talk about uh, specific PM 2.5 data which are approved by the World Health Organization, how those data has been created and how to access some of those data sets. With that, uh, I will do uh, a one minute pause and then we'll go to the question answer section and I will be happy to respond to all the questions which you might have. Thank you everyone. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, and I will start answering, responding some of the questions which I see. Uh, please feel free to uh, type your questions under the question sections in your uh, control panel. Uh, if uh, I would like to mention to a couple of to, uh, couple of things before we start the question answer that all the materials, uh, the copy of this PPT is also available in Spanish. Uh, the homework link is also available in Spanish and that is pasted in the chat window and it will also be available through our web page uh, if you have difficulty in accessing uh, the files in English and if you like to use the Spanish version. So please feel free to do that. Okay, so the, uh, the first question is it will be useful, helpful if you put explanatory note of the equation on slide number 35. Uh, I think that's a great suggestion. Uh, probably uh, we will include that a little bit more on that. Uh, but uh, just so that since you asked the question, I would like to actually explain this, that slide a little bit uh, here uh, before we move on to the next question. So if you can see my uh, slide, uh, what you see here is a uh, equation which is i equal to i0 exponential to the power m and tau, m into tau. m is a, a air mass factor uh, which is a 1 over uh, cosine of solar zenith angle, theta 0 is a solar zenith angle uh, and it depends on where the sun located. Uh, and the I0 is the top of the atmosphere radiance, uh, radiation in that particular uh, wavelength and I is what is measured at the surface by the sun photometer. Uh, there are methods to calculate I0 theoretically uh, based on these measurement under uh, no aerosol conditions. And what you make measurement is a total optical depth which has a component of Rayleigh optical depth, uh, aerosol optical depth and gas optical depth. Uh, gas means due to the absorption of gases like water vapor, methane or ozone. Uh, Rayleigh optical depth is a you know, due to the air molecules uh, inter uh, by, mostly by scattering. And since we know the amount of uh, air molecules in the air uh, by knowing their pressure, we can calculate very accurately uh, the Rayleigh optical depth. Similarly, we can also calculate based on the properties of the gas and their concentration we can theoretically calculate actually gas optical depth. Once we have these two quantity, we can subtract that uh, from the total optical depth which is measured by the sun photometer and that's how we get aerosol optical depth. Uh, but again, I take your suggestion and we'll try to put explanation actually uh, in the note section. Thank you. So let's get back to the other questions. How can you differentiate PM2.5 PM and PM10 in remote sensing image? Okay, uh, again very good question. Uh, so as the name suggests, PM2.5 are uh, represent the fine particles uh, which generally originate from the fossil fuel burnings or biomass burning, sometimes fine dust. And PM10s are mostly the coarse size particles which also include PM2.5 in it. Uh, 
uh, mostly dust, sea salt, or larger size particles. Uh, if we make measurement of this aerosol optical depth in various channels, various wavelength, uh, then up to some extent we can differentiate that. Uh, it is not always possible to actually separate the particles into different size bins. Uh, some sensors, uh, for example, MISER, due to its specific design and capabilities, we can differentiate the particles in fine, coarse, uh, or medium size range. But uh, it's still, uh, there is limited capability from the satellites to actually separate the particle into different size range. Um, therefore, we use indirect method to infer uh, PM2.5 by uh, obtaining the relationship between those quantities, uh, as we have seen in many slides during this presentation. I hope that answers the questions. Another question is, is there any baseline lowest diameter of the aerosol which is captured by the satellite while computing the AOD? Uh, no, the short answer is there is no baseline or the lowest diameter. Uh, satellite can actually capture some micron size particle which are less than half micron or less than one micron size particles. Uh, you know, sometimes nanometer size particles, very fine dust, very fine smoke particles. So I don't believe there is any uh, any range, uh, specific lowest diameter range which we can put. Uh, if particles are very fine, like le if they are smaller than the air molecules, particles, uh, then depending on which wavelength we are using, they can be captured in AOD or they can be in, uh, they can be transparent to that particular wavelength. So more smaller particle, you have to go to the lower wavelengths to really get the signal. Otherwise, they will be invisible to the wavelength at which we are making measurement. And that's one of the reasons we make measurement in the visual part of the solar spectrum because that's where the particle size is also dominated. I hope that answers your question. Can you recommend a reference for learning about the difference between each satellite that measure AOD? Yes, so uh, on our website, our set website, uh, uh, we have the uh, recordings available for the uh, basics of satellite remote sensing for air quality and where we actually in week three and four, we talked specifically uh, different sensors and different satellites uh, and their aerosol product. Uh, we also talk about their limitations and advantages. Uh, there are other uh, mm, there are other references available there uh, which should provide you more details. Uh, and if you can, if you really want to look more specific, please do send me an email and I should be able to find a proper reference which will talk uh, multiple satellite at the same time. Okay, uh, another question, it is not clear to me which one is measured by the satellite. PM2.5 or AOD. So satellite, Again, satellite does not make measurement of either PM2.5 or AOD, but what we get from the satellite, the retrieved quantity is aerosol optical depth AOD. But there are methods in which we will talk about in week two, which you can use or people have used to convert this aerosol optical depth which you get from the satellite to PM2.5 mass concentration. And we will talk about that in week two. Okay, uh, another very interesting question. Is it possible to use this aerosols data for atmospheric correction of other satellite images? Uh, the answer is yes and no. Uh, people do use satellite derived aerosol product uh, for other atmospheric correction to other satellite images. Uh, but 
Aaron it usually for more accurate estimation of the atmospheric correction. Aaron it data are often used because they are considered more accurate. Uh, but un depending on your application, what you are really, how accurate you wa want to achieve uh, the atmospheric correction, you can use the satellite data uh, or it may not be able to, you may not be able to use. Again, it really depends on the uh, accuracy level which you want to achieve for atmospheric correction. Okay, uh, there is another question. In slide 46, there is a geographical variation in the correlation of AOD and PM2.5. Why most western area have low values? It is related to their closeness to the sea? Okay. As I was explaining earlier, uh, the variation in this relationship between AOD and PM2.5 depends on number of parameters. Some of them are related to the retrieval accuracies of the satellite aerosol optical net itself and some of them are related more to the PM2.5, how the PM2.5 is regulated near the surface. So specifically to the western United States, uh, if, you, if you know the geographical reason well, the western US is more bright, has more bright surface. Uh, as compared to the eastern regions, less vegetation uh, that provide brighter surface to the satellite. And when the surface is much brighter, it's not dark enough, then satellite algorithm do have trouble in separating surface from the atmosphere. And that can create more uncertainties in the aerosol optical depth data. Second is the type of aerosols. Uh, varies between Eastern United States and Western United States. In West, you will see some component of dust and black carbon, whereas in East New US, most of the aerosols are urban aerosols, which are like sulfate and nitrate type. Uh, so those are some of the differences. Other parameters which might have impact are meteorological conditions, uh, could be different in different parts of the world. Uh, closeness to the sea, uh, I would say may not be a big factor because uh, again probably it will depend on a specific station to station uh, but in the sea is also the available in the eastern US as well in the western US. So I don't think that is any specific reason for that. Okay, uh, could you please share the Aeronet website for the atmospheric correction, yes. Uh, great, so uh, the Aronet website has been already posted in the chat box and you can see the answer there. Okay, uh, there is another question, it says, is there any differentiation between the capacity of satellite to perform over the heavy polluted regions, that is IGBP, uh, those who are not familiar with the IGBP is Indo-Gandetic Plain over India and Nepal region, or moderately and low polluted regions are the satellite best suited over heavy polluted or lower polluted regions? Okay, this is an excellent question. Um, again, it depends on which satellite we are talking about. Different satellites uh, have different uh, uh, capabilities uh, under low aerosol condition and high aerosol conditions. Uh, let's take an example of MODIS sensor which we have been talking throughout this webinar series. Uh, does uh, provide uh, good accuracy over heavily polluted regions. Uh, and if you have a very clean environment, like uh, uh, then the errors in the aerosol optical depth could be larger. And uh, if you are interested, please send me an email and I will sh 
send you a validation data uh, paper on Modis aerosol optical dam, uh, which will tell you actually different parts of the globe where and how the Modis performance looks against the aeronet. Uh, uh, so the accuracy actually varies in different parts of the world. Uh, if there are very heavy thick aerosol smoke plumes, uh, then sometimes actually spotlight can have hard time in separating them from the clouds and that can create another uh, type of problem. Uh, but uh, I will not go into detail over here. But please do send me an email if you are really interested in learning more and I will be happy to share a uh, validation paper of what is aerosol optical lab. Uh, the website which I just listed uh, is a dark target uh, uh, provide uh, details on uh, uh, modest product and its validation around the globe. Uh, so you might want to check out that website uh, if you're really interested in a particular location about the quality of the data. Okay, I think uh, if there's no f any further question, uh, thank you everyone for attending and uh, again the recording of this series will be available uh, if you would like to hear it again or if you want to pass it on to your friends and colleagues, uh, please visit our website. Uh, please complete your assignment uh, before the next week, uh, uh, so it's due on March 21st. and. Uh, Thank you for attending and uh, I will be happy if you have other questions through the emails.